Welcome into another episode of the Winsome Creationist podcast. I am here with um, my my new friend Tico, who I, I Tico, that is the right way to say your name. Is that correct? Close enough. Yeah, it's Tico. Yeah. <laughs> for a for a southern boy from uh, North Carolina, um, it'll work, right? So very good. Um, I, I, and we we've chatted a few times via email over the years, and. Uh, you are the author of one of my one of my favorite papers um, that I've read in, in quite some time because it really gave me a uh, sort of a renewed hope um, from the angle of solving the distant starlight problem in creationism. And if you're not familiar with that, um, well, number one, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably at least a little bit familiar with it. Um, but if you're not familiar with that, uh, we are definitely going to dive into that today and talk a lot about what the distant starlight problem even is and um, this uh, this what I believe to be a pretty innovative solution to it. So um, without further ado, uh, Chico, I'd love for you to just kind of take a few minutes to introduce yourself to the audience. And uh, if you'd like to kind of sure. go into the thought behind why you you guys wrote this paper, that would be awesome too. Yeah, that's great. So um, I, uh, I became Christian in 2004 and um, almost immediately, I my, my wife and I, we became Christian at the same time. I mean, almost immediately, we wanted to just find a way to combine or reconcile the Bible and, um, and science, because uh, it looked like there was something um, not, uh, not quite uh, aligned, right? Like we didn't know anything about creation science at that time. And we made a decision to basically trust what the Bible says, just like straightforwardly what it says. Uh, and it was a kind of a decision of the will, and we knew that there will be some problems, uh, but we decided that, yeah, we'll ask God to, to reveal to us the solutions. And so we were very proud of these decisions, um, this decision. And um, I talked to my spiritual dad, uh, who uh, he's with the Lord now, um, who I greatly respect. He's a very, very strong Christian. He, he helped us uh, bring us to, to faith. And, um, and his very first question was, um, was almost like a rebuttal. He said, what about the distant starlight problem? And I had never heard of that. Um, and, and he works with a lot of university students. And so I think he must have been asked that question a lot. So he told me, you know, this, this is the distant star problem. Light problem, you know, like stars are billions of light years away. How come uh, we can see them if the Earth is only and um, creation is only six thousand years old? So I didn't have an answer, but I thought this would be one of those things that we would ask God for, and uh, maybe in time uh, it will be uh, it will come about. Um, so um, a few years later, uh, we decided to homeschool. We went to a homeschooling conference. I met some creationists. I read Dr. Humphrey's um, book on. Um, style and in time. And I thought, this is exactly what I wanted to do. This is great. Uh, can I please uh, find more people like this? And um, uh, soon enough, actually, we made a decision to uh, go to Mississippi. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Hostemeyer, Hostemeyer, one of the co-authors of the paper. Um, and, um, and he invited me to do some research with him. And so that's how I ended up um, actually doing creation research. Uh, and uh, I started on this long journey. I thought it was going to be a very long journey about um, understanding space and time and all these other things um, through different lenses of, of, of science and technology and, uh, and, and even engineering um, so that perhaps I'll solve this problem. And I um, actually it turned out that I think the solution is very simple. Uh, I'm going to try to explain it. It's hard to explain, but it's very simple. Uh, but in that process, um, um, actually, God led me to something even more interesting and more important, and I want to say something about that at the end of the presentation, which has to do with design. Yeah, yeah, and, very good. Uh, exactly. So this this um, this problem actually, I, I really don't think it should be a stumbling block for Christians or creationists. It, it is not a difficult problem once you understand uh, relativity. Um, I don't claim to have a solution in in the sense of how God did it, but it is a it's just a solution. It's a existence proof, meaning that there's, there's many ways you could you could understand how this works, uh, and this is one of them. Um, and so um, we can we can discuss a little bit of that. But um, I, I remember this this one time when um, I was at the Logos conference uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Baumgartner, and um, we were we were looking at the presentation about the um, uh, paucity of uh, Supernova remnants uh, by, uh, by Davis, and, um, and the basic idea of that presentation was there are just too few 
supernova remnants um, for the world to be old, for the cosmos to be old. And so at the end of the presentation, John, John and I looked at each other and John was saying, this, this means that creation somehow was, was being made outside towards in. He had this picture of creation kind of like going in, in outside towards in, in and, uh, and basically light just kind of traveling together with creation. And I, and I thought, well, it, it's probably like that because, you know, the observation tells you that way. So, so we just have to put it together with, with some, make it consistent with, with relativity and everything, make sure it works with, with scripture. And that's how the origins of the paper started. So um, the, the, the rest was just working through, through the ideas, you know, kind of distilling them and, and um, uh, doing some more refinement on, uh, on Davis's research on, uh, on supernovas uh, to make sure the numbers work out because there were some criticisms of that research, initial research, and it turned out that they worked out. Um, Nowadays, we actually have even more evidence that uh, that the distant uh, cosmos is young uh, now from the uh, from the James Webb Telescope, uh, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that. But uh, that's yeah. the basics about how um, how I got started with creation science and how this paper um, originated. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, uh, I I'm having a really hard time not jumping ahead here because even just with with, with what you've said already, there's so much I want to like say and, mm -hmm. and come back to i really feel like but i, I think we're going to hit most of those things so so i'm not worried about that um I, I really think it's important though to just underscore the fact that this whole you know the whole journey started with just kind of taking a look at god's word and saying that's what this book says and we're going to trust that um no matter what and you as you know probably probably even better than me you know, that leads to in the scientific community, a lot of criticism and a lot of, oh, well, you know, your, 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 your starting point is the Bible and not science. But, you know, I love that we can, I think it's that sort of faith that the Lord uh, rewards. And it, it reminded me of another one of my um, favorite ideas in the, in the creationism space, the idea of the, the floating forest theory that uh, the Kurt Wise suggested about the pre-flood world. And um, I love, he's got, you know, I don't know if you've seen it, but he, there's a YouTube video of him presenting this at Truett yeah. McConnell. And it's, it's it just really goes into the idea of um, that same thing, faith and trust that, okay, we don't know what the answers are yet, but uh, God is pretty smart since he created everything. And so since his word seems to say this, then we're going to start there and we're going to let the evidence fall into place um, when it comes. And that dedication and commitment is the kind of thing that the Lord seems to reward. And I definitely get the sense that that's been the case with this paper. Yeah, it, it definitely worked out that way. I, I think um, faith, it, it was a journey of faith, as you say. Um, but faith is, is really about trust and, and obedience. Um, and not so much just blindly believing a statement, but it's about trusting that God, just like what you said, God knows what he's doing. Maybe I don't fully understand it now. I'll ask him and he will reveal things uh, as the time comes and as necessary. And he actually says that in his word as well, right? Like if you, if you like wisdom, you can ask for it. Um, and also, you know, cry out to me and uh, I will reveal things to you that you've never heard before. And it's, it's just great. It, it, it works out. Um, yeah. What a, what, a, what a cool place to be able to do science from, right? The place of, of, in a sense, uh, surety of the outcome. And it's really just an exploration to figure out how we got there. And, and I think that's why, why I love this paper so much. Um, and so we're going to begin to dive into that as we, as we begin to dive into this as a uh, proposed solution for the starlight problem, you said something interesting, you know, you said, you know, based on what you've, you know, the conclusions that you've come to, it really doesn't seem like this should be a big deal. It really shouldn't be a stumbling block. Um, and yet, and yet for many it is, right? This is still a really, really big deal. This is even one of the arguments that I still hear old earth creationists point to quite a bit in terms of, oh, this is going to be a big problem. for. So can you, as you begin to, to discuss this, and you tell me when you're ready for the slides, first of all, if you're listening on audio, now would be a really, really good time to stop it and go over to YouTube and find it on YouTube because this one is going to be a little bit more visual in nature. Um, a lot of stuff we're going to be able to talk about just on the audio, but it, it might be able to help to get a sense for the visual. We are going to show some slides. So if you're listening on audio, 
uh, come on over to YouTube for this one and, and, and check it out. Um, but as I was saying, as you begin to dive into this a little bit and you let me know when you're ready for the slides, um, just kind of, if you would, why is it such a big deal? Why is the distant starlight problem such a big deal and why has it it been because I think understanding that will help us understand your confidence in a in a solution as well. Mm, sure. Yeah. So um, I'm sure many of your uh, listeners know that according to the theory of special and general relativity, the speed of light is limited is limiting for all communication. So and it's uh, and it's actually not a very large limit. It sounds large to us, but on a cosmic scale, it's not a very large limit. It's three hundred thousand kilometers per second. Which, which means that um, for, for life to reach us from the distant uh, expanse of the universe, it would have taken uh, billions of years um, uh, travel time. And um, um, that's if we, if we estimated the distances right. Um, so this creates a problem for a young Earth creationist um, where, according to scripture, it looks like um, the universe is created uh, within the last 6,000 years. Now that the universe is created within the last six thousand years, follows very straightforwardly with scripture. If, if you got, if, if 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 you're not familiar with how this works, it's actually very simple to work out through through the ages of the patriarchs, the promise of Abraham, the Exodus, uh, the, the the creation of the temple, and then the um, um, the exile of of Israel. It, it's a, it's a very straightforward computation. It works about to six thousand years, sometimes seven thousand if you um, if you take some of the um, there's some variations with the Septuagint, but it's still um, about the same order of, of magnitude. Now, uh, some people may uh, argue, this is talking about Earth, or is it talking about like the cosmos in general? So we will cover some of that, but um, they're generally, um, as the Earth creationist, uh, we tend to all believe that the Earth is uh, about six to 7,000 years old. Um, but some of us may tend to also think that the, the, the rest of the cosmos may be older. Uh, I don't subscribe to that view for various reasons. Um, but in any case, it's, it, it does create a problem. If you were to believe in the straightforward word of scripture, uh, which yields about 6,000 years, how is it possible that um, light, uh, light could be traveling for more than that, for like billions of years? Um, so <clears throat> there, there are many things you can try to question here. Is the, is the distant universe old? Uh, or is it perhaps not as big as we think it is? Um, well, let me just tell you right away, the universe is bigger than 6,000 light years in diameter. It would be really, really tight to fit uh, all the masses of, of, of the planets and everything. And, I, and our observations are really good. Um, so one thing actually that um, I would like to propose here, and, and I know maybe a lot of people would, uh, would take issue with it, but I believe our science is actually very good in terms of what it observes and the um, data that it get, gathers. Where it begins to become questionable is how you make conclusions from that data. And that's really what we were going to uh, discuss here. And then we'll try to, I'll, I'll try to point out to the one principle that really is at the core uh, that creates a lot of problems that is actually not founded on science. It's founded on pure faith. Um, and it's actually wrong. But the observations that we get from astronomy from um, you know the things you can get in the lab, those are actually really reliable, and uh, it, it will be very difficult to. Um, in fact, it will be it will be not be prudent to come up with theories that contradict them um, and, and try to somehow explain that they're wrong when when we can confirm them. So, um, so we can I think we can be fairly sure that distant stars are very far, um, and we can also be very sure that the um, the light has a limited speed. Um, and, and again, some people have tried to suggest that light was moving faster in the past, but that has some problems as well, and I can get into that. But that's, this is, in a nutshell, the, there is a, a paradox, and I want to actually call it a paradox, not a problem. It's a paradox. It appears yeah. to be a problem, but actually it's not a problem. And the reason why it appears to be a problem is because we think we know something about special relativity, and therefore we come up with this contradiction, apparent contradiction, but if you actually learn more about special relativity, the contradiction goes away. So it only go, it's only if you know it halfway or if you understand it halfway and you apply it halfway. But in the end of the day, it turns out to be a paradox uh, and, not, and not an actual problem. Okay. All right. Yeah, great. Well, that's helpful to know. We're going we're gonna to dive right into that. Let me say one thing at the, at the start. I think um, 
So a, a buddy of mine pointed out, and I, I haven't gotten too deep into the intricacies of this, but a buddy of mine pointed out some potential biblical problems with the idea that, okay, well, maybe Earth has only experienced about 6,000 years of time, but that the rest of the universe has mm -hmm. experienced significantly longer amounts of time. Um, and so um, while I'm sure we'll go into this at various points here, I think to get it out up front, one of the assumptions of your model is that the entire universe is the same age. Uh, right, approximately the same age. Yeah, they could be the small, small variations, but we're not we're not going to say that uh, the rest of the universe is developed over billions of years, and, and Earth is only six thousand years. Right, right, very good. So, should I add your slides in? Um, sure. So, um, to um, to really like understand what we are um, talking about, I I need to explain a little bit about special relativity uh, because I'm going to use some diagrams to uh, illustrate the points that I'm trying to make. Um, so the first the first diagram here is to just uh, introduce the basic vocabulary of special relativity. Um, typically, we we uh, draw these things, uh, these space-time diagrams, uh, and at the horizontal dimension is corresponds to space, and the vertical is time. Uh, sometimes this may be the opposite of what you may have seen in your algebra class, uh, usually time is horizontal, but this is a, a tradition, so I will just follow with the tradition. Um, the meaning of each point on this diagram represents an event. An event is something that takes place in time and space. It has both time and a space component. So an event could be uh, uh, like a photon gets created and, and you know it, it begins to be created. Um, or it could be two particles meet, or something like that. Uh, it, it's a very specific point in time and space. Um, but if you want to represent a particle that's that's moving through space, then that will be a line, and it's called a world line. So here is a line of a particle that's moving. Um, and then there is a special line that represents a particle that's um, moving at the speed of light, or a photon. photon. So here, at event C, the photon was emitted, and it, it's now moving very fast uh, in away from the origin uh, and uh, and it's following this, this straight line here. Uh, so because the photon speed is the limiting speed for everything, um, you would expect that everything else, all the other world lines will be less tilted than the line of the photon. That's, that's kind of the basics of, uh, of these diagrams. Um, the, um, the, let me just skip to, uh, to this diagram. Um, what it's really important to understand that um, because of the limited uh, speed of uh, of light, uh, we we have something that we call a light cone, and it's a cone because it's actually there's an extra dimension here. You imagine here it's kind of rotated in a, in three D. Uh, but what this light cone represents is the the future and the past of a given event. So here I have an event E. And uh, again, this is something happened like, you know, uh, the dog bit me at E. And then D represents some event that happened uh, later in consequence of E, like I went to the doctor. Okay. Um, and event C is something that happened uh, that could have caused E to happen, like C maybe is where I, I petted the dog. So these three events are causally dependent. Uh, now, in in our normal parlance, we tend to think of this as past, uh, present, and future. Um, and 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 normally we would say that's the only categorization of events. But in in special relativity, actually there is another category of events that is neither past nor present nor future, and those events are causally independent events. So here is an example: is event B. So event B is something happening that is outside of the light cone of event E, and that means E and B are not influencing each other in any way. Now, um, is, is B happening before E or after E? Actually, it's undetermined. So if you just look at this diagram, it looks like B is happening after E, but that's only because you happen to be an observer with, with this reference frame here, um, where it looks like B is, is above Kind of like if you if you plot the coordinate of B, it's going to look like it's it's um it's happening after E on on your timeline, but actually, if you're a different observer, you may actually see B happening at a different time. Here, A is another example like that. So A, according to 
the um, the solid line reference frame is happening before E, but according to the uh, the dotted line reference frame, it's happening after E. So this is called a uh, um, relativity of simultaneity. Um, it, it, it basically just means that B and A, they are not really determinable in terms of whether they happen before or after E. We can only say that they happen um, independent of E. They're causally independent. So to summarize, in, in normal language, we will tend to think of past, present, and future. But when you switch to special relativity thinking, you know, you put like a special hat, right? When you think of special relativity, then you have to think in terms of um, past, present, and causally independent. Okay. And and the fun thing about this causally independent thing is that they can, there are a lot of them. You know, if, if you just think of present, you will think of a single line of events. But for these causally independent things, there's so many of them. And there's, as far as special relativity is concerned, all of them are causally independent. So this is going to be the key to solving the distance sterilite problem because what we want to show is that the creation of the stars in day four um, was causally independent with day four on Earth. As long as we can show that, then as long as that is possible, while at the same time light arrives to Earth at, 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 you know, in day four, as long as that's possible, then then we can claim that the stars were not created before Earth or before day four on Earth, and and our problem is solved. Partly, you know, it's solved, you know, to a degree. And but, but I, I will, I want to, I want to get into that in in, in a little bit. So, um, I hope sure. this is, I hope this is understandable. Steve, what do you think? Does this make sense? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I definitely get it. I think it's going to make. You know, I have a little bit of. Uh, additional knowledge here because I know how the solution is going to work and those watching and right. listening maybe don't yet. Um, but right, just to kind of, again, to zoom out to the things that really, really matter, uh, the idea is that we we want the light from the stars to reach Earth on day four, but from a, um, but we also want them to be biblically created on day four. And yeah. what what you're saying is that scientifically, in order for that to be the case, these two creation events are going to have to be causally independent. Is that accurate? Correct. They have to be causally independent. Otherwise, if they were causally dependent, it, one of two things will have to happen: either the um, the stars were in the past of the uh, the star creation was in the past of Earth Earth's day four, in which case basically we'll fall back to a solution where stars were created billions of years ago before day four on Earth, or we'll have to claim that day four on Earth is very, very large or something like that. So we don't want that to happen because then we're going to run into some, you know, scriptural problems. Um, so we want to avoid that. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that whenever a star is created and the light starts traveling out of the star and reaches Earth, it's going to reach Earth within the time frame of day four. So both of those things are kind of a constraint here to what's a possible solution. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me, for sure. Yeah. So now the um, the key to the solution is that physically, we cannot tell whether, like like I was saying earlier, we cannot tell physically whether E and A are simultaneous or before or after. Um, there is no way to establish that kind of truth through physical measurements mm. uh, because of, of the inability to synchronize very distant events. And then... And, um, that follows from special relativity, and it's going to be a long topic to discuss. But um, you know, if you could just bear with me, that's yeah. what we know from physics. So, what physics, what that means is that we now have a choice uh, of picking these things. That is not a is not going to be inconsistent with it. It's going to be consistent with the physical theory, but the physical theory cannot determine that choice. And so, this choice is going to basically come from the one event that is not a physical event that is a supernatural it's not a natural event it's a supernatural event which is the creation of uh of the universe so that event which now exists across all of space or at least all the space that was there at the time um that event is going to determine what we can say is the simultaneous simultaneity it's going to actually determine the plane of simultaneity that is special that plane by itself cannot be determined such a special plane cannot be determined through physics but it's consistent with physics, it makes sense, right? Like, 
you yeah. if you choice here, we, we pick one and God has sovereignly chosen to pick one in such a way that we can see stars. Um, so that's that's basically the um the, the basic uh, the basic uh, insight here for the solution. So let's um Yes. And, and to me, I think while you're pulling up your next sort of slides, like to me, I, I think that makes sense. So something that uh again, I, I want to try not to jump ahead, but um and I'm sure you're gonna get into explaining this, but you know, this is this is based partially on the idea that um, there are there are choices that can be made both in how we observe things like the speed of light. Um, and there's also um, at some point we have to look at reality and be like, OK, uh, reality is the way that it is. Yes. As Christians, we are positing a divine origin for reality. That is that is absolutely true. But what you're saying is, is that there's not really a some sort of physical parameter that we can point to that invalidates that suggestion. Right. I mean, we're, Correct. we're kind of saying, we're kind of saying, okay, yeah. Cause, uh, cause let me just talk this through because like when I first, okay. When people are first introduced to, and, and I'm just going to say this because I think some of my audience will already be familiar with this. When, when I was first introduced to Jason Lyles anisotropic synchrony convention, mm -hmm. um, thought number one was, well, that's, cool and makes a lot of sense thought number two was wow that seems really like like we're really just making things up here right that was like a slight of yeah yeah, it's yeah. Like, you just yeah. made the you find the problem away yeah. you define the problem away that, that that's right so without giving too much away because i want you to explain it i read your solution and i was like okay this seems a lot better this seems like we're not so much now I will admit, though, thought number two, when I read your solution was, okay, this 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 still seems like it might be a little bit of special pleading because we are positing a divine reference point and origin for these things. But um, two things led me away from that. Thing number one being what you just said. Um, if there's nothing physical that we can point you to and validate it, and it's actually a choice that we're welcome to make, then... I think we're welcome to make that choice. So that, that problem goes okay. away. And, and then the other piece of that is that it, it's more theological in nature. It, it's more, it's more about, well, what did God intend? What did he want to happen? We know from the theological standpoint that God um, did not want his people worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. They were on earth to provide a function okay so that's a that's a theological sort of reality right. that i think yeah, most people yeah. would would agree with I'm okay yeah <laughs> that's exactly right yeah that's exactly right all right so so another another point there being well if uh if the creation is not indeed millions of years old and uh, there's certainly no biblical suggesting or, or no biblical suggestion that it is, right? If anything, I, uh, a friend of mine, Doug, he said it so good uh, um, one day. He said, you know, it's like an old earth creationist, the best they can hope for is that somehow scripture can be made to be consistent with what they're teaching, with with, with conventional, you know, old age science in that, in that regard. Um, right. But it can never teach it. And at the best case, the the Bible teaches young young age creationism, right? You can really get that. Uh, right. from the text itself right and so if, if if all those things are true then god setting things up in such a way that would allow the star sun moon and stars and all of that to shine their light and, and to accomplish the purpose for which they they were made to accomplish which is to so that humans could see them at the very right. least two days later after they were created if, if that's true but also the earth wasn't created and the universe wasn't created billions of years before that then something like what you're getting ready to tell us about seems entirely reasonable. So with that said, I'll bring up the slides and let you dive in. Yeah, exactly. So um, basically, God, God can provide the synchronicity that we cannot provide from from um, um, through just physical observation. So um, what, what I want to show here is um, it's a rather complicated slide, but it is actually the so the whole solution of the problem is in this one slide. Um, see, I'm going to step through it slowly um, to explain what it shows, uh, and uh, later I can illustrate it illustrate uh, with an example. So what we have here is actually two light cones superimposed on top of each other, and um, 
Uh, the first light cone corresponds to the beginning of day four on Earth. So the, this event here is the beginning of day four on Earth, and that forms a light cone down here, and the path and the and the and the future events of that light cone are up here. The second event is this point here uh, above. Uh, which corresponds to the beginning of day five on Earth, and that now forms another light cone. Um, if you if you draw the um, the the lines at the forty five degree ag uh, angles, and so the shaded area above here uh, uh, corresponds to all of the events that have we can properly say they happened after the beginning of day five on Earth, uh, and everything that's the shaded events down here uh, correspond to. Anything that we can properly say was the um, before the beginning of day four on Earth. Um, so that leaves us with a white region, which is actually quite large, a white region of space-time, where any event in this region here, we could claim that it happened, um, we, we could say that it happened at the same time or during day four on Earth, and we wouldn't be wrong. We could choose to say that, and we wouldn't be wrong because uh, it, it is technically causally independent on anything that was happening uh, on day, during day four on Earth at that time. So God could have picked to create the stars in any of this white region here, and scripturally and physically, it would still be counted as day four. Um, so in this particular case, we propose that he actually picked a surface. Um, in this case, we just see the cross-section of the surface, so it's really a line that is enclosed between the two light cones. Uh, it's a hyperboloid line, and uh, uh, and that the star creation events happen along this line. So here I have an example of a star creation event, uh, and so uh, when this star was created, it was um, technically um, not in the past of day four and not in the future of day four. So technically, we could we could claim it simultaneous with day four. It's something that we we can establish as a as a as a choice. But when that star was created and light now begins to shine from that star, uh, as, as the light travels parallel to the light comes, we see that it, it hits Earth during day four uh, on Earth because this is the beginning of day four and this is the end of day four. So, so the light, again, to summarize, the star is created uh, during an event that is um, causally independent with day four, so not before day four. But and yet the light somehow is able to reach Earth um, between the beginning and the end of day four. That's it. That's the basic solution. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at that, um, looking at looking at the diagram, even though when you first look at it, it's a little it's a little confusing. After the explanation, I mean it really seems to make sense. I think the example would, would probably help clarify, like, you know, how do we how do we experience something like this uh taking place, you know, like, like in, in regular life? You know, that that would be interesting. But but yeah, this this definitely makes sense uh, to me, and I'm, I'm interested to see, like, as we go forward, what sort of objections there even could be to this, uh, and and how you have how you address them in the paper. So sure, yeah. Um, let, let's try an example. Um, this is actually another favorite example for creationists. Um, let me try to flip to the next slide. Uh, actually, I need to go to this slide. Sorry. Um, so. Here, the example is that of a, um, it, it's, it's a supernova that was observed in 1987. Uh, and this is a, it's a famous example because um, supernovas don't often observable in our modern time. So when we observe it, you know, people kind of treat it as a very interesting and special event. So now we also know that this supernova was about 868,000 light years away. Okay, so let like I, I was saying earlier in the beginning, and we're not going to I'm not going to question that distance measurement. There is we have very good technology and uh, and observational techniques to very you know to to measure that. So based on that uh, based on that fact that it's 868,000 years away, do we then conclude that this supernova was created some 162,000 years before the creation of the Earth? Um, that's really the question here that I'm going to illustrate with an example. Okay. So, um, if, if we, so, so in this particular, in, in the previous, in the previous slide, I, I was, um, I was showing how the creation of that supernova would have happened somewhere near the light cone of Earth on 
day four on Earth. So here, that's what's happening here. So that the, the star is being created uh, just slightly above that light cone. And therefore, the light of that star would have reached Earth back on day four of Earth. And then it would have been continuing to reach Earth. More light would be coming like that until uh, eventually the star explodes. The supernova explosion takes place. And the image of that supernova explosion finally reaches Earth uh, around our present day age, you know, which I just approximated here to 6,000 years uh, since creation. So that's where we see the explosion happen. Now, does that mean the star was created um, before the Earth was created? Uh, no, because um, as, as we were discussing earlier, the star was created within this white area of this light cone uh, where it would have been properly considered to be um, causally independent from day four. It was not in the past of day four. So it's not before day four. Um, but it but it can be counted as if it, it also happened on day on day four. Um, so now what does it actually mean for for the star to have been created on day four? And this is where we come to the uh, to the idea or the, the title of the paper or the subtitle of the solution, which is the creation time court events. Um, so what, what do we mean by that? A, a time coordinate is basically just kind of like a, uh, just like a, a milestone on the road, right? You put a milestone to indicate how far you are from a particular point. Uh, and in this case, the, the time coordinate tells us how far we are from creation. So a time coordinate, uh, basically, we can imagine that these time coordinates are assigned to every point in space or every object in space. In this case, um, the star is an object in space, and we have assigned to it a time coordinate at any one point in time, we can ask the star, what is your time? And the star could, if it had a clock, it could look at its clock and say, yeah, and right now I'm two days since my creation, or I'm like 10, I'm 10 years since my creation. So when the star, the star exploded, and, and if the star could look at its clock, and if we could ask it, what is the time right now on your clock? The star would say, I have been, created about 6,000 years ago. My, my clock tells me 6,000 years. So, so basically, the, its time coordinate is therefore representing an objective value. It's not dependent on the observer who is looking at the study. It's actually, by the way, one of the differences with live solution. We're not talking about observers here at all. Everything here is objective. Yeah, It's fixed to some physical reality. And the reality of creation is the most physical of them all, oh, right? Everybody could, at least in principle, have declared how long have I been around since my creation, every point in any, every object in space. So the star would then would be 6,000, its creation time coordinate will be 6,000 uh, years. So the star was not created before Earth, uh, but somehow again, light was able to reach Earth, um, even though the star was uh, 168,000 light years. Oh, sorry, I removed myself by accident. Uh, yeah, okay. So, right. We, so in that sense, we all kind of have a creation time coordinate, <laughs> you know, all, you know in, a, in, a, yeah, in, a, in a certain sense. Um, so, to clarify, when um, the, the, the supernova, that star, exploded based on this solution in 1987, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And then the and the light. Now, so let's go there. So let's maybe talk about what is Jason Lyle's solution. Brief explanation of that, and and then maybe the similarities, differences, modifications that that, that you all introduced. Because I think I think even with all of this, with all this knowledge, with everything that we've talked about, it, it might still be a little unclear. Like, wait, so light doesn't really take millions of years. So then. So, like, how how is it that we can just say, oh, light now instantly travels to Earth? Like, so let's talk through that. Yeah. So before I go to Jason Lyle's solution, let's talk about how fast light travels. Okay. Yeah. Um, light is a very interesting object um, that... Um, let, let me just ask you this. Um, let's say that you have... Um, well, what's, what's the nearest star to us? Oh, hang on. Am I, uh, my headphones are cutting out on me. The nearest, the nearest what? 
the new Star Trek. Um, uh, um, the the sun. I would. I mean, is that let's is use the sun? Okay, we can use the sun. I was thinking <laughs> of another star, but sure. Let's uh, let's use the sun. Okay, so light travels from the sun to Earth in eight minutes, right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, that's from our reference frame. That's from the viewpoint of somebody sitting on Earth. Um, it kind of like stationary with respect to the sun. If if you are if you are traveling with a spaceship past Earth in a very fast spaceship, you will actually see that the light reaches Earth a bit faster. Depending on which direction you're moving, it may reach a little slower, a little faster. But you will actually the, the time it takes for the light to reach Earth will be different. And why is that? Because special relativity tells us that the, um, the the distance between the Earth and the Sun is actually not an absolute thing, but it depends on the observer. It depends on whoever is moving. So if you're moving very fast, that, that distance is going to look like it's shrinking. Okay. So what it means is that the time for the light to reach Earth is is relative. It's not it's not a very good quantity to use. It it, it works out for us because uh, you know in a kind of like we like to think in terms of those quantities, but it's not it's not a what mathematically we call invariant quantity. So a better quantity to use would be to actually use something called um, proper time, because then we can say it's objective. The proper time is basically what happens if you if you if you take a clock and you attach it to the traveler, like and you and you actually measure how long that traveler mm -hmm. takes to reach Earth. In this case, the traveler will be the photon. So how would it take for the photon to reach Earth? Like if you're looking at your watch. How long does it take for the photon to reach Earth? You know. If you're, uh, I'm sorry, my, my headphones are still cutting out a little bit, and I'm not very good with trivia. So, <laughs> hey, uh, no, it's not, it's not trivia. It's, 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 it's... So, you are the photon. You just you just go on your photon spaceship. You're leaving the sun. You're about to get to Earth. How long does it take to get yeah. there? I just got on my spaceship. I'm leaving. Park. Yeah. Yeah, so, I don't know. I'm, not, I'm missing it. <laughs> here is the trick. Here is the thing. Um, it actually takes you zero time. It, it, it takes zero time. So if you have photon and you travel from any point A to any point B, and, yeah. and you have, if you could have a watch and you look at the time on your watch, it will always take you zero time. Okay. So, so this this is a, this is not automatically a solution to the problem, but this is an example of why this problem is a little bit more than what it seems to be at first. Interesting. Right. So, all right. So, so let's hang on. Let, let's just park on that for a minute. So, so I'm a photon and you're asking me the photon, how, how long does it take for me to I look, I look at my watch and how long did it take me to get from point A to point B? And you're saying that that is zero time. In other words, you're there all instantly. the time. It's all yeah. zero time, all the time. The photons travel zero time everywhere. They don't experience time. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so it is, I, you know, for people who like live and breathe relativity, this is like obvious, but, um, yeah. it, but it takes a little bit of time to understand how this works. So let me just explain how this works. So it's kind of like this. So um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who know a little bit of relativity, they, they know that when you travel closer to the speed of light, distances shrink. It's called, uh, you know, Lorentz contraction, right? So now imagine you're traveling very fast, maybe half the speed of light. And you're traveling from the sun to the earth. Well, from your perspective, that distance is now a lot less. So it will take actually a lot less time to travel the distance than, than on paper, how long it would have taken you with your velocity. Now, if you get closer and closer to the speed of light, the distance becomes closer and closer to zero from your perspective. So eventually, actually, you travel zero time, zero distance. The speed of light actually is zero divided by zero from the yeah. point of view of the photon. So Right there, you should start thinking about there's something weird about the speed of light. So already, like you should start thinking, like maybe this problem is not what I thought it was because yeah, I'm, I'm, it's not like this photon is traveling a really long time and you know somehow it's been aging. No, it's the photon is not actually aging at all. Yeah, it is it is not. But um, yeah. So that's that is one special thing about speed of light. Well, and this is I mean this is um is it accurate to say and and again if I'm if I, if I'm not a scientist, like, it is certainly true that I'm not a scientist. And as much as I am not a scientist, I'm very much not a physics or or star kind of guy. Okay, so I love the stuff, but I don't I don't know very much about it. So is this what it 
is referring to when you think about the speed of light when they say it's a measure of distance, not time. The reason that is, is that is this accurate? Because because you're not actually measuring it in terms of time. Is this the same thing or is, this, is that different? Uh, this may be a little bit different. The speed okay. of light actually is an interesting quantity that connects distance with distances with time. Um, so okay. we sometimes could just speak in terms of distances uh, when we speak light years, you know, we speak in time. Uh, and vice versa, we could think of time as the distance that light would have traveled. Um, uh, and, and that becomes a measure of time. Um, so, but um, what this actually comes to show is that um, if you were to try to understand, for example, how is it possible for, like in, on this diagram, let me just get my laser pointer again. How is it possible for this light to apparently be traveling for such a long time? How is it possible that that it didn't travel for that long time? And and, and it is because um, because the the time that's experienced by the photon is is actually zero all the time. Um, gotcha. So. so um, I like to use another example, and I, I'm, I'm not. I mean, you can, you can choose if you want to include because it could take a little longer to um, to explain. But it's it's another way to think about this, um, and maybe it actually would would work without even using any diagrams here. But um, it goes like this: Imagine that you're leaving, um, you're leaving Shanghai at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And, and you get to LA at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Do you think that's possible? Oh, well, like with time zones, right? Yeah, with time zones. Yeah, of course. It, it's possible, right? Like, yeah, it's possible. sure. Um, because the, um, because Shanghai is, is a few hours ahead of LA. I think it's like nine hours ahead. So if your plane, you know, is fast enough, it could actually be traveling in such a way that each time it hits the new time zone, it's still four o'clock everywhere it hits the time zone, right? Yeah. So, so can we can we say that the the, the plane traveled at zero speed? Uh, I mean, sorry, at infinite speed, like uh, zero zero time. No, we cannot say that. Um, why can't we say that? Because we can very easily verify that the, it took time for the plane to travel. How do we verify that? Well, there are two ways at least. You could let's say you board the plane in Shanghai and you call your friend in LA, and uh, and and you say I'm about to leave now, and your and your friend in LA looks at the clock. And and then when you arrive, uh, your friend looks at his clock again and takes the difference. Yeah, that's you know you traveled for nine hours. So you didn't you didn't cheat. That's one way, right? You could also just simply wear a watch on the plane, and as you're traveling on this plane, you just look at your watch, and when you arrive, you you realize yeah that it's been nine hours. Now, with, if you were not the plane, but the photon, as you just say, none of these two things work at this point, mm. right? They don't work because you couldn't have called your friend. Because now the signal, the, the, the call that you have to make has to go ahead of you. That's not going to work. Nothing travels faster than you. And you couldn't be sitting on the plane looking at your watch because your watch is basically not going to register any time at all. You're just going to be arriving the moment you left. So for the photon, you're in a different situation. Yeah. So what I would like to propose here is that essentially God established a kind of a time zone like in space. And so, you know, these di diagrams, they're basically just doing that. They're illustrating it in with a more uh, special relativity um, kind of coded language, but it's essentially the same thing. It's like a time zones where basically the time zone represents the, the time since the creation at that time. And what do time zones on Earth represent anyway, right? They represent uh, the time since the beginning of the day for that location. Yeah. And so in the same way, I, I propose that there are these time zones in space which represent the time elapsed since the beginning of creation. But because of this special property of light, as light moves along, it, it will be hitting those time zones at exactly Memories. four o'clock or day four uh, everywhere. Yeah. And it will eventually hit Earth at four o'clock or day four. I'm using four o'clock as a kind of a. Yeah, yeah. An analogy. No. That makes a lot of sense to me. That's that's now that's language I can understand. Yeah, that makes that makes a ton of sense. So, um, right. And, and so, so what does this have to do? How does this tie into the idea of like of the of the ASC, like the one way speed of light and all of that, and the initial conditions? Can you tie? Can you kind of tie that all together now? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the ASC, um, which stands for a uh, um, asymmetric synchrony convention, um, is basically the idea that we cannot measure the speed of light in one direction 
And so we got to set up a con by convention to decide what we wanted to be. Um, and so Jason Lyle, who is a proponent of uh, the ASC convention, is basically saying that we can count or reckon the speed of light coming from the stars towards us as infinite, and then light coming from us towards the stars is infinite. So uh, this is half half C or half the the, the round trip speed of light, uh, and then all the equations will work out and everything will be happy. So that is a um, there's an interesting argument to that, um, but it's uh, there's also some caveats to it. Uh, and and I I, um, I want to show you um, that with some slides. I can illustrate with a few slides here. Let me just see if I can turn my slide forward a little bit. Okay. So so basically, what 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 Jason Lyle is saying is we have different reference frames. So this is the this is the conventional uh, um, ref, uh, the conventional way of thinking, uh, which is also known as Einstein synchronic convention. So in the Einstein synchronic convention, you have two different observers; they're moving with relative speed to each other, and therefore they can observe these two events A and B um, in different relation to each other. Mm -hmm. What Lyle is basically saying is, I don't have to stick with horizontal axis, or I don't have to stick with straight line axis. I'm just going to actually bend my my spatial axis, and that creates a new convention, a new synchronic convention. Um, and so I can have an observer down here who would perceive these events uh, as, as being uh, ordered in one particular way, but an observer in different point in space will perceive those events as ordered differently. So like the blue observer here, uh, that observer will see uh, A happening before B, but the red observer here, which is in a different location in space, uh, he will see B happening before A. So that's, that's the... Uh, Mm -hmm. A synchrony, uh, sorry, the um, asymmetric synchrony convention. Um, so, so far, so good. It looks like you could do this um, module some, you know, mathematical uh, problems here around around you know breaking your axis and then creating a discontinuity. But those are like things that are not you know they can be corrected. You know, it's not a big deal. The the problem the problem here though is that we haven't actually done anything different. You see, we have changed our axis, but that doesn't really like change the physical reality. The physical reality is ultimately these points here in space. So simply changing our axis doesn't really introduce a solution to the problem. Um, also, claiming that the speed of light uh, is different in different directions has confused a lot of people. It's, it's leading to a lot of confusion, but it's actually a bit, it's both correct and misleading at the same time. It's correct that you can say, uh, that light is traveling these vast distances in almost no time. But what you're actually saying is that the coordinate speed of light is different. And the coordinate speed is not a physical speed. Coordinate speed is kind of like you're changing your milestones, you're changing your tick marks on your axis, and you're now you're claiming you're moving faster or slower, but you actually physically are not moving faster or slower. You're just you're changing your tick marks. Um, and so, so that's what's happening here. We're changing the way we reckon uh, time. Uh, a simultaneity, and because of that, we are now reckoning the speed of light to be infinite. But the physical speed of light is not actually changing at all. Like nothing physically is changing. Um, so how is this different from uh, from the uh, the uh, for example what, what what we have been proposing with the uh, creation time uh, coordinate um, or creation time synchrony convention? The difference is that with the AC, it all depends on the observer. So you're changing the observer, somehow things are supposed to change. So what Jason Lyle does then is he says, we will put the observer on Earth because somehow right. God claimed that Earth, it should be the observer. Um, but um, he didn't change anything physical. However, there has to be a physical difference. Uh, because if you, put the, if you put the observer on, on the stars, you could then claim that the, uh, the star, that the light from the Earth would reach stars also on day four, but that's actually not possible. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have those right. make a round trip in, in four days. And now when you look at the creation time coordinates, you will actually see that there is a physical difference. The physical difference comes from the fact that we are, first of all, we none of this depends on observers. It's all very objective. It's basically, basically saying there is an initial condition by which God 
in a way creation happened and by which God basically set the zero meridian, so to speak. Right? Mm -hmm. um, he basically determined what we count as, as the zero time. And so if this surface here is this axis, so you can see it looks almost, it looks similar in some ways with, with just the last solution because, you know, you also see the axis kind of bending here. Representing the uh, the plane of simultaneity, but there are no different observers. Uh, it's not observer dependent. So, um, so now based on this reckoning, point A, we can always say that point A happened before point B, in, in actually in some absolute sense, because point A, according to this uh, convention, was created or, or did happen. Uh, sorry, its its clock sequence creation was a lot shorter than point B. Point B's clock sequence creation would have been this long. Point A is clock since creation will be clock. So now you have an absolute ordering of events that doesn't depend anything on the observer. And, and according to this absolute ordering of events, light from Earth would not actually be reaching star, the stars at all. Because it would, you know, if stars were down here, right? They were created right here. And let's say Earth was created up here. And now light from Earth starts moving. It won't reach the stars, the distal stars for billions of years. They're not going to see Earth. Now, that's. That asymmetry is interesting because actually it's kind of it's kind of hinted at in, in Genesis one. And remember in Genesis one, um, God established the dominion of, of of man over creation, but he missed one part of creation. Right? He says he should rule. You know what he said? Like the fish of the sea, the beasts. Of yeah. The air, but he didn't. Yeah. Say That's correct. Yeah. He didn't say the stars. So on the other hand, he created the stars to be for signs and um, seasons. So we are in, in, we can be causally dependent on the stars, meaning like stars could somehow affect our behavior because we look at them and they'll represent something, but we cannot affect the behavior of the stars. The other direction doesn't work uh, because of, you know, because of this, but also in scripture, he didn't tell us to do it. And if he told us to do it, that would have been a problem because we couldn't have done it. We could not have ruled right. over the stars. We don't. We don't. We can extend our maybe maybe in some other uh, you know in some other future spiritual future, but not not in our physical universe. We cannot influence stars that are far away. Uh, the light from Earth cannot reach those stars in time. Wow, that's fascinating. That's actually really fascinating. Yeah. So the stars can influence us, but we can't influence the stars. Yes. Yeah. Right. They are. They are causally. I mean, eventually, the the light gets to us so causally they they can cause things but not the other way around it, it's there is an asymmetry there yeah yeah wow that's really fascinating um okay well we are we are really moving along um i, I want to be respectful of your time i know you said you had one thing you want to mention i have a feeling i know what that might be um but yeah ba based on all of this like if, if there's time to kind of like maybe go through and just say um a, a, a word about how this is maybe superior to to a few of the other solutions that have been offered. That that would be really good. I, I've definitely got time for that if you do. Uh, but then, yeah, if you want to kind of take us to you know to the close and sort of wrap it up with your thoughts, um, sure. that would be I, great. I have a bit more time, uh, so we can go as far as you want to go. Um, I can so I can mention okay. briefly um, comparison to other solutions. Um, yeah. First of all, before I start comparing, um, I, I want to say something that has been. I think it's very important about how we um, how we interact with each other as creationists, as, as scientists, and as people. Right? Um, you know, there there is a there is a verse in in First Corinthians thirteen which says that you know we see in part and then prophecy in part, right? And so I, I do believe that scientists are like the modern day prophet. Um, you know, they're they prophets and nothing they aren't. But you know, we 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 hear things, we see things from God, and then we we have a certain way of prophesying, but we prophesy in part. And, um, and whatever we say, whatever we, we come up, uh, these ideas are just pieces, and we really need to be able to um, see the, 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 the inspired idea in each other's solutions. So actually, when I um, when we were putting together this paper, this we, we borrowed ideas from so many other solutions, right? and we we validated so many other solutions. Um, and uh, so I don't want to sound like somehow this is superior in that sense of like, oh, I can look, I've sold it and the other ones haven't. Uh, it, it's really, um, every solution has, not everyone in the same way, but but there is there is something you can bring from everybody. Even the most, the, the most uh, uh, goofy solutions 
you know, can actually teach you a lot uh, and, and it's worth thinking through and not just dismissing it right away, right? Um, but but some of them are actually very good. And I think, for example, Lyle's solution is great. I, I think it really, like, it's, it's a really good solution. Uh, I think it's been criticized unfairly a bit too harshly. Uh, it does have some problems, uh, but um, I think it does point also at hints at a, at a solution like like you like you saw here. The main idea that the relativity of simultaneity that's a really key insight in the live solution, and uh, and you know, we leverage it here very heavily. Um, then then there is other solutions as well. Of course, you know there is the uh, uh, there is solutions that try to uh, play with the speed of light, where it might have been very fast in the past and now it's slower. The problem with that type of solution is. Uh, is that there would always be some kind of remnant of that will that will betray uh, like like if that were to happen we would actually see some physical observation that will that will tell us that this happened like for example if, if the light slowed down significantly we we would see um um we would see distant stars uh, blue shifted or uh, or red shifted uh, depending on which way the, the the speed was changed and and they would be actually not visible. Uh, because they would be red shifted or blue shifted out of visibility. So there's a lot of these solutions that you have to understand the consequences and, and what would you observe as a result of those consequences. Um, then there is a category of solutions that um, try to make the, the, old co uh, the, the distant cosmos old. And the reason why they, they try to make it old is because they, first of all, they struggle, on one hand, they struggle with, with getting this, the light come here fast enough, but uh, but I really like another reason is they, they do believe that the observations of the, the different cosmos appear to be of, of um, uh, to show a age. Now I can turn that around, and uh, and actually what I think the distant observations show is that the cosmos is about equally old everywhere, mm -hmm. and, and and that's that's really striking, right? Because because in in conventional secular cosmology. Um, the distant cosmos should look younger, right? So, so there is a notion that distance means back in time, but we don't observe that actually. Uh, that's not what we see. Um, and then some of that is in the paper. We talked about like the, um, uh, the, the certain types of stars. And actually, we borrowed that idea from Jason Lyle's research, where he talks about how these stars um, uh, they, they shouldn't be there if the distance cosmos is that old. But nowadays, we also have more data from the James Webb Telescope, uh, where yeah. You know, lo and behold, and by the way, every time I get new data, it invalidates the, you know, the, the secular uh, cosmolo cosmology, and then they have to fix it, and then it, next time we get a new batch of data, it gets invalidated again. Um, but yeah, like this, this particular one was that distant galaxies, which are supposed to look young, they don't. They look um, just as old as everything else. Um, so what, what that basically means is that distance does not equate to age. Uh, and that, that is a very important um, Observational fact. Um, now, does it mean that the cosmos is old or young? It, that's a bit subjective now, right? Like if you see two yeah. galaxies eating each other, you might say that has been taking place over billions of years. God couldn't have just credited it that they're eating each other at that moment. But that's kind of subjective, right? But what, what's important is that distance doesn't equate age. And, and, um, and so if you believe the Earth is young and the vicinity of the Earth is young, then I think it makes sense to just think of cosmos being more or less the same age. And I, I say more or less because, of course, yeah, the, you know, time can flow at different rates in different parts in space. But not so wacky as like billions of years over there and, and, uh, and a few thousand over here. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the gist of it. I mean, there's different yeah. types of alternative solutions based on old age, based on speed of light changing. All of these have some problems, but uh, all of them, they, they have some good insights as well. And I think Jason's is uh, actually a really good one. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I more or less see the, this, the creation time coherence as a kind of a fix to it. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I think that's fair. I mean, I, I see that too. And uh, no, I appreciate what you said. I mean, this is, after all, the um, winsome creationist podcast. And so the, the idea yeah. is... Yeah, we're not, uh, you know, we're not, we're not mad at each other. We're not in a, we're not in a fight over like different models of things. I think we're probably, unless you tell me otherwise, I think we're still probably a long way away from um, anything like a full creationist cosmology and consensus around these solutions and ideas. I mean, we've, we've kind of been away from that for, yeah. uh, for a while. Um, and uh, lots more, 
lots more work to do and room for further research. But uh, at, a, at a certain point, we do sort of have to stand on those who have gone before and, you know, take the best part, you know, pieces of their work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just think this is um, a really, and I thought it when I first read it a few years ago, and I still think it now, I, I just think it's a really helpful contribution that deserves probably more press than it's gotten. Um, I'm not sure that I've ever seen anybody other than me talk about it. Uh, and maybe that's just my lack of um, being informed. Maybe I need to say it, you know, but I mean, I, I do watch this stuff pretty closely. So, um, but yeah, I'd mm -hmm. like to see more people hearing about this because I think um, um, it, I think, like you said, it takes the best pieces of, especially Lyle's solution, provides an objective basis to, in a sense, fix it. Um, and gives us something really helpful. So I, I love that and I, I deeply appreciate it. Great. So uh, I, given that, I, I want to actually move on to the thing which I think is even more important than solving the digital starlight problem, um, yeah. which is about um, how do we take the notion of design and, and, uh, and apply that to science? Uh, yes. Because that is actually what um, secular science is missing. I call it yes. the blind spot of secular science, right? So, so if you kind of like look at the balances of where we stand, you know, there's so many more secular science, so much more money and prestige. And, and then you have like this, a few creationists that some of them are kind of like, really, they, they have some kind of like really crazy ideas, but actually somewhat good too. And then there's a few who are a little bit more experienced, but very few. And so it almost seems like we have so little strengths. Um, just kind of like what we say about the church in Philadelphia, right? It's like you have so little strength, but you know, but there is this open door, which the creation side, the, the, sorry, the secular scientists do not walk through. And that's the, the idea of, of design and purpose, right? When you can ask questions about uh, why something is built and how it's built and, and the structure of that thing, um, that you, you really can only come from, um, from, from believing, believing in creation. And this is where, this is a really big, significant blind spot. And, and, and so to illustrate that blind spot, um, take, take for example, um, uh, the, the most popular uh, cosmology out there, which is the, uh, the Lambda CDM, also known as the, the Big Bang cosmology. Uh, the way this cosmology is built on is, is basically, it has, you can think of it as having two parts. One of them is the science part, um, sorry, the, the, the theory, which is the, uh, the the general relativity, mainly. Uh, there's other theories in there as well. There's quantum theory and so on, but it's mainly general relativity. And, and that is actually a very solid theory. It takes that theory and then it combines it with a essentially completely preposterous initial conditions. And the result is complete garbage. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and it's complete garbage. We know that because the observations pretty much don't, don't match with predictions and they have to be correct all the time. But why is that? Why does it do that? It's because it's based on these initial conditions um, that result from the belief that the Earth, that the universe is not created. And that is also codified with a term called cosmological principle. And the cosmological principle is basically saying that um, every place in the universe is more or less the same. Like there's no special location. The universe is a very large scale. In scale of scale of 100 megaparsecs, it has no structure. So we can treat the universe as essentially a an ideal gas in its own sense at that large scale. And we can write a very, very simple equation of state and, and we can evolve based on that equation. And, and of course it simplifies the math, it's great. Uh, but it, like I said, it, it yields some preposterous outcomes which um, don't quite square the observations and continuously need to be adjusted. And there's plenty of presentations explaining yeah. that, but I just want to focus on this premise of like, why does this work? It's because it starts with the premise that there is no creation that there is no creator. And, and there is some, a little bit of basis in that because we look from Earth around and we, we look at what we see and we say in all directions, the stars more or less look the same, you know, like kind of similar density, the, the micro background radiation is more or less the same. You know, of course, there's some variations, but we say it's more or less the same. So either one of two things is, is the case. Either the Earth is in a special location of the universe or every location in the universe is the same and then therefore everybody sees the same thing. Um, but of course, you know, the Earth cannot be in a special location because that smells of creation. And that's not true yeah. because we all know that God doesn't exist and so on. So therefore, we pick the other option. And so that becomes the principle under, under aligning all of, all of, um, all of the, uh, of the cosmology. And that, that is, uh, that is, uh, 
instead that is based on actually a denial of creation. So any biblical creationist or any person who believes in Bible who tries to reconcile that with scripture is always starting on the wrong track because they're not reconciling silence with scripture, they're reconciling a faith in non-creation with faith of creation, which is just not going to work. Um, so that's that's the that's the sum of it. Now in like you, we will see here in this solution of the creation time coordinate solution, we actually do put Earth in kind of a special place. So we haven't changed the science, we haven't changed the theory. The only thing that we've changed is we 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 basically repudiate the notion that everywhere is the same, that somehow Earth is not special. We we kind of put it in a special place, um, and and I think it is special. Um, the Bible treats it kind of specially, um, so it, it's it's. It's fine to think of it that way. And, and when you put it together with, with the, what we know about science, it actually works out. Um, so, um, so that's the first part, is we need to base our uh, research in the notion of design and creation. Now, when you talk about design, the second thing... Um, Real quick, to you, but before we move on from that, I want, I do, I, let me make one parallel here. Would it be fair to say that... Um, we need to start thinking about, like creationists in general should start thinking about a rejection of the cosmological principle in sort of the same way that they already mostly think about a rejection of the idea of uniformitarianism. I'm just trying to draw some parallels. Yeah, I know they're different yep. things, but yeah, I know that well, and it's pretty common for a creationist to reject uniformitarianism because that is a fundamental assumption that if, right. you, if you take it off the table – it informs so many other things. So, so I think maybe we should we should make rejection of the cosmological principle as famous as rejection of uniformitarianism uh, from a creationist yeah, perspective. So I just wanted to make that very, point. Yeah, it, it's very much. Um, it, it, it's ba that's the basic. Um, that's the basic idea. Yes, that's that's exactly right. It's it's a it is a it is a rejection of uniformitarianism um, in in both space and time. And then, and yeah. so typically we think of uniformitarianism as kind of like uh, in time, right? Like, like, just like what uh, I think was it uh, Second Peter three, which talks about like that. Um, essentially, they did. The, then the people, the scoffers, think of everything happening all the same, the same all the time. But they forgot that at some point there was this special event that by which God created their universe, and then there was another special event by which He kind of destroyed the most things, and then He recreated them again. So time is not, you know, uh, things that don't happen in time kind of uniformly. The same, play, the same way in space, right? Things are not uniform in space. Space has to have structure. There are structures everywhere. Actually, in fact, nothing that works is without structure. Everything has structure. Cities have structures. Human cells have structures. Human bodies have structures. Um, you know, planets, uh, planetary systems. Everything has structure. It's really like preposterous to imagine the largest, single, uh, most complex system in the world which is the whole universe doesn't have structure at its largest length. Yeah. It has to have structure. And if it has length its structure, you have to take the tools of engineering to understand that structure. Science is actually not enough. You have to understand how structure modifies behavior. And this is actually where my, my PhD thesis was about. Uh, it, it's about it's about bringing this value of structure. And you have to look at this as, a, and this is where Dr. Hostemeyer really inspired me. You have to look at structure as the, the guiding principle in any kind of research, you have to really look at it as an engineer. Um, uh, you know, and so um, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to find um, a slide I had here um, to illustrate yeah. this, but I, I can I can just talk about it like very briefly. You know, if you if you imagine a bridge, right? A bridge is built of steel, right? Um, do you just take a sheet of steel and unroll it and call it a bridge? You don't do that, right? Because it's going to flop, it's going to bend. You actually, yeah. then instead you put it together with, in shapes of trusses and you, and you build structures out of it. And now this same steel that was flopping before, now it becomes a rigid structure and you can actually do something with it. So the structure of the, of the object defines uh, its properties. Uh, when we talk about things like general relativity, we're just studying the material. We're studying the, the material the steel in this case, um, and, and we're ignoring the part about the structure. But you need to bring the structure in there. And when you bring the structure, you can now begin to observe, begin to explain things that you couldn't have explained otherwise, you could explain observations you couldn't have explained otherwise. And again, this is a blind spot in, in a secular 
uh, in circular uh, thinking, because why would there be structure if, if there is no design? Uh, structure implies design. Uh, and, um, yeah. and it's also a bit harder on the maps. But if you're an engineer, you know how to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, and if you're a creationist, even better, um, you, can, you can think of there was a structure. Yeah. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. So, and when you think about it, like, it is. You use the word preposterous. I don't think I've ever thought about it this way, but it's true. Like, the notion that Earth is not special is highly preposterous. I mean, how could there be anything more intuitive when looking at what we know about the cosmos that the Earth is special? So it hardly seems like special pleading to suggest that the Earth is special. If anything, it's the other way. If anything, it seems like it would be special pleading to suggest that it's not, given the overwhelming right. evidence that it is. That's right. So, so, yeah, I think... That makes that makes a little sense. Well, man, this has been this has been a very educational time. Um, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. Um, I'm glad we were able to 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 make it work and make it happen. Um, I, I'm sure that um, there are going to be folks with questions at some point. Is do you want to make available any way for people to maybe reach out to you from time? You know, if there's something that they have a question about or whatever, is there a way that you'd like people to get in touch with you, or do you have any social media or anything like that? You, you let us know. Um, sure, you can you can just email me. <laughs> That's the the best way. That works. I, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you want me to? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you want me to share your email address, I will. I can put it in the show That's notes fine. or whatever. People can contact can you. Yeah. 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 Very good. Or if you want to fill, you know, people want to filter through me, that's fine too. I, I can kind of get in touch with you, but this has been very informative, very helpful. Um, thank you so much for your time. What are you up to these days? Do you, do you have anything new kind of research wise on your plate or? Um, I, I have some ideas that, um, um, I, I slowly bounce back and forth with, um, with other creation yeah. colleagues and, um, yeah. Um, you know, it, it is, um, it, it is, it is challenging to, um, to, the community is so small and, and it really needs to work better, uh, together. So, um, I, I'm, I'm just hoping in some way so I can, I can help others, um, to yeah. kind of bring out what God is telling them. Um, and, um, I, you know, right now, for example, I, I'm, emailing with a few people and they have some good ideas. There are some parts that need some improvements, but it's always, um, it's always just a pleasure to see how that works. And, um, you know, that's, that's yeah. that just brings a lot of delight to me. Yeah. In other words, there's always, always a little something going on. Yeah. in in the background and maybe, maybe when the next thing surfaces, um, yeah, definitely we'll have you on to, to talk about that. I'm excited. So, Okay. All right, my friend, uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you again for your time. Thanks for everything. Um, maybe yeah. I can even get some of the slides from you or something to share with people. That would be uh, potentially. Yeah, yeah sure. Or I, they can I, go check um, out the paper as well. So, yeah, yeah, I can send you the slides that they are uh, very much close to the paper. It would be easier to, and you could probably yeah. include them in the uh, in resources of, um, yeah. uh, of the video. Yeah. Very good. So, okay. Uh, All right. Thank you again, my friend. I really appreciate it. All right. Very good. God bless you. And uh, you too. Be with your ministry. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.